Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Big Jiu Jitsu Show. I'm a member of the Pod Bros Podcast Network. Don't forget to go to podbros.com and find yourself another podcast you want to listen to. And don't forget to check out our sponsors, Trap and Roll Soap Company, Rolls Gear, and Tape Armor. I'm Rob. And today we had Randy Wark on the show. You know, we talked to him before about, you know, uh, law enforcement and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and how they come together. And we had another really good conversation about teaching and kind of perspective on students and again like controlling uh using Brazilian jiu-jitsu to control people on the mats or on the mats as well as if you're in law enforcement use that so i hope you guys enjoy it and uh don't forget to uh go to itunes check out some of our old episodes subscribe to us rate us and uh follow all of our old stuff at bjjshow.com got a break or uh no i'm off i worked last night um for 4th of July at the uh, Coco Booth Amphitheater, they had like 25,000 people come out for fireworks, and so I had to work extra duty to, at that. But um, no, I'm off today. I got to I gotta teach jiu-jitsu and kickboxing tonight, so this is kind of my little downtime, so it's perfect timing. Nice, dude. I'm glad, I'm glad it worked out that way. What was the last time I was in there? Um, the last time I was at this, in uh, North Carolina, I actually did go to Coco Booth, so I feel your pain, man. It's kind of a madhouse out there during events. I'll tell you, people, you, you find out just uh, <laughs> just the type of people that, you know, come out and how, how much of an asshole people can be sometimes. Because uh, <laughs> right, right toward the end, I, I mean, here I worked, you know, just kind of 10 hours out in the uh, sweltering, humid heat in North Carolina. And, you know, you get people out. You deal with people all the time. And you're just like, man, I'm ready to go home and just kind of go low key, have a beer, you know, and. I'm trying to walk back to my car. I'm already off duty. I'm off the clock. I'm just trying to get to my car. And I get surrounded by about eight old people. And, uh, man, they go, <laughs> they were mad because of traffic. And they were mad that they were having to wait. And then so one lady's asking me where a certain parking lot is. Another lady's yelling about traffic. This old guy is yelling at me about how they need to organize this event better. And in my head, all I'm hearing is, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like, I just want to go home. I looked at him and I said, look, 30,000 people needed to come in. 30,000 people have to leave all at the same time. So you're just going to have to wait it out. Like, I, I'm going to be waiting in the same traffic you're waiting in, you know? But it's it's so frustrating, man. You get you get burnt out. You're just like, I'm ready to go. <laughs> no, nah, man, I don't blame you whatsoever. I mean, um, before I get into my Coco Booth story, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Big Jiu-Jitsu Show, I'm Rob, and today I've got Randy Work with me. And uh, I guess we're doing our part two of uh, – I don't know however many parts we're going to take this to, but uh, just kind of talking about, um, see, Randy's a police officer in North Carolina and deals with a lot of different folks and uses his jujitsu and actually instructs jujitsu, if I remember correctly. That's correct. Yep. And then uh, we're just going to talk about a few subjects. And, you know, Randy, I really do appreciate you taking the time out to uh, come on the show today, man. Yeah, I love I love being on here. I was excited when you asked me to come back, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So, Coco Booth Amphitheater is kind of a uh, like it's it's interesting. It really is because it's kind of in the middle of middle. Well, not really the middle of Cary, but kind of like outside of it. So, I mean, it's a uh, it's still kind of a popular joint. But like when I went there, and don't judge me, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. He was some like Australian light alternative love song singing guy. And, uh, I know me, I got a, I got a reputation up hold that I, I don't, I, I had a good time still Vance, Na- Vance Nash, Joy Vance, Vance Joy. You know what I'm talking about? It sounds, it sounds like some Coco Booth style music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I was calm. I was like, Oh, that's pretty good. Real good. But yeah, the, the parking oh. out there is a nightmare, man. So I can't even imagine dealing with a group of people that, you know, you're just like, what the hell do you want me to do? Like just, you know, start issuing citations for people who are trying to get out. Well, and it's always a standstill, any major event at any, any amphitheater, any concert. I mean, I went to uh, Foo Fighters in Greensboro last year. And then again in Tampa uh, with a friend of mine this year. And, you know, it's my all time favorite band and they're, they're still pretty big. So the events are pretty massive and you're going to get stuck in traffic. I mean, I would like to think that nowadays everybody knows if you're at a major event, 
you know, in a concert, you're talking what, maybe 9,000 to 20,000 people, depending. I mean, you're talking in excess of 30,000 people at a 4th of July gathering. I mean, of course, there's going to be traffic. That's common sense. But I mean, you know, well, common sense isn't all that common these days. And I don't know, <laughs> man, like, you know, what's a went to was a concert a couple of weeks ago and it was the only thing that was real fortunate about it was it was walking distance from my house and that was about it but man it was still you want to you want to go to the bathroom you're waiting in line you want a beer you're waiting in line like there's there's no way around it and people are still like i don't know surprised by it like have you never been to a concert before yeah that's what that's what i'm amazed by is how self-centered some people are i think that's you know keeping it kind of on the topic of jiu-jitsu at the same time, because, you know, we all know jiu-jitsu is basically a microcosm for life anyway. No. Um, but one of my favorite things about jiu-jitsu is that you don't really run into a lot of people that are selfish and self-centered on the mat. Like everybody, yeah, I want to work on what I want to work on to improve my skill set, but I also want to help you work on your game. And so, you know, just that that community itself is already a huge improvement upon what I see, you know, out in the streets in law enforcement or at a concert, you know, People need to get outside their own head and kind of be a little bit more considerate of other people. I mean, yeah, if you got 30,000 people in attendance, guess what? 30,000 people are going to be stuck in traffic having to wait their turn to get home. You know, we're all kind of in this together. So, yeah, and it's, I guess, the whole like being comfortable with being uncomfortable type type of situation. But yeah, you know, like you said, self centeredness really doesn't have a place on the mats. And I'm actually really, really happy that I guess the stars aligned for this uh, episode with you coming on. Because there's a video that was published not that long ago. Maybe I, I'm saying like even hours at this point. But did you happen to see the video of Matt Sarah subduing the drunk guy at the restaurant? I just watched it this morning, actually. So yeah, it's perfect timing. <laughs> I was, I was, and and that's something I wanted to get your opinion on, right? So you know, I've talked to my guys about this. I've talked to my students about this, and I preach it a lot. So you know, your jujitsu should translate everywhere you go. And one of the things that a lot of people, you know, the the whole self defense versus sport jujitsu, like, I think it's kind of dumb. The whole like, I, I see merits to both, but at the same time, like, it's a martial art. You're supposed to be able to use that for self defense. And I'm not okay. saying, you know, jumping on somebody and heel hooking them to death because they're trying to hurt you is a bad thing. What I'm saying is like, there are alternatives to doing that. And one of the good ones was, um, if you haven't seen it, ladies and gentlemen, it's a video of Matt Sarah in a restaurant, you know, in full mount position, holding this guy's arms. And the guy's like, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm going to kill you. And Matt Sarah's just like, Hey, <laughs> calm down, man. Calm down. And the guy keeps yeah. talking about, I'm going to kick your ass. Fuck you. You know, Matt Sarah's laughing at this point. And he's like, nah, man, just calm down. Then finally the police show up and the guy's screaming. He wants to press charges. And that's where the video ends. But like that was a perfect example. I think of using jujitsu for controlling somebody and not taking damage or dishing out damage at that point. Well, I agree. And I think, you know, this is a topic that I, I feel like I get involved in a lot, especially in, in my profession. And, and what I do is kind of a additional um, you know, additional duty to what I do. I mean, I teach law enforcement officers and a big part of what I teach obviously is jujitsu for this very reason is control. That's, you know, that's a big part of what we do when we take somebody into custody or have to calm a situation down is establish some type of control. And there's wrestling, jujitsu, any type of grappling art is the best for that. And so you watch that video with Matt Sarah and what you notice is this guy, mm -hmm. it's Matt the Terra Sarah. You know, this guy, it, for, you can call it a lucky punch, you call it whatever you want, but the guy was a welterweight champ and was a highly accomplished mixed martial artist at the highest level that you can get to. Not to mention being one of the most devastating black belt grapplers in, in the history of jiu-jitsu. And the guy is just, he's amazing. He could have destroyed that citizen, could have absolutely mangled and killed him if he wanted to. And he didn't. He didn't cause any damage from the video that I saw. Just, you know, outstanding control from Mount. And that's what I teach a lot to, uh, even when I'm teaching self-defense at TFTC, and we're talking about jiu-jitsu and using it in that realm. Like you said, there's sport, there's self-defense, you need to play with both, and there's some bleed over, and there's some, you know, carryover, obviously. But I was teaching a uh, technique from Mount. This was, this was probably a few months ago, and it was actually a conversation that me and uh, Rodney had not too long ago. But I was teaching a technique from Mount, and one of the first things I talked about was, hey, look, if I establish Mount on somebody in the street in a self-defense scenario, um, 
guess what? I'm probably not going to spin for an arm bar, even if they're pushing up on my chest. Yeah. You know, I'm going to swim. In, I'm going to swim inside, get inside control, lower my level a little bit, establish better control. Or like, wouldn't you watch Matt Sarah? What did he do? He controlled his wrists, just kind of redirected his hands, kept his hip pressure. He didn't. He, you didn't see Matt Sarah, black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu, UFC former welterweight champ, spin for an arm bar, right? He he kept control because that's the safest place for him to be. He's in a dominant position, probably. I would say the second most dominant position you can establish. And he knew he wasn't in any danger. So he kept it there and waited for help to get there. You know, that's per- picture perfect. And that's, I'm sure if he was on this podcast talking, which would be incredible, by the way, if you got Matt Sarah on your podcast, uh, more but, than, I'm, I'm going to try to work on that. But, <laughs> but he's, you know, I, I guarantee he'd say the same thing we're saying right now. It's, hey man, you know, it was, he'd say with that New York accent, I can't, I can't duplicate, but uh, <laughs> we probably say a couple of fucks here and there too, but he would, you know, he would say that he was just controlling the guy. He didn't want to hurt him. He was just, you know, the guy's drunk. He doesn't know what he's doing. And Matt Sarah knew that he had the ability to control him safely. And he did. It was beautiful. It was a good video. Yeah, it was, um, I was actually really uh, excited to see it. And I, of course, posted it to um, my, uh, what was it? The the group page of the uh, club I run out here. I'm like, see, this is what you're supposed to be looking for, you know, making sure that you're, you know, keeping, keeping yourself safe, all that other good stuff. But, like... You know, for somebody like yourself who works in law enforcement, I know there's some carryover with um, with uh, military as well. That mainly it's all about control and just hoping that you can control the situation until somebody's either there to help you or you have to end it in a certain way, depending upon what that is. Right. Absolutely. And then also, I got to give Matt Sarah props for the weekend at Bernie's reference that he made prior to. Did you see that part? No, I didn't see that part. So the guy was drunk with his. I think it was probably his girlfriend or wife or significant other of some sort. And uh, she was plastered and passed out drunk. And so that's what kind of started the situation from what it seems like. The video kind of cuts out. Yeah. But he's he's using his uh, selfie camera on his phone and he's recording what's over his shoulder. And it's the, the drunk guy trying to basically wake up or corral his drunk girlfriend who's passed out in the booth at the restaurant. And Matt Sarah just said, you know, that it was like it looked like a weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> um, it's pretty hilarious, but... But no, it is. I, you know, jujitsu. Um, you definitely have to be able to apply it in various ways. It's not. You know, I think that there is certainly merit to a lot of the sport jujitsu, and I would say that under most circumstances, somebody that is highly trained in jujitsu, be it sport or self defense, still has an advantage. But it's just a matter of being able to understand what positions are best when and where. Because I think a lot of times people get lost in the safety. Um, that the mats and the dojo offer, you know? And so if, if you go for certain positions out there in the street and you've got somebody who's determined enough and, and has enough fighting experience or, or just sees the opportunity, you're still wide open and, and exposed to strikes and weapons and all types of different things. And there's no perfect technique. There's no perfect martial art. But I think if you learn jiu-jitsu and you keep things in mind and every now and then maybe maybe, you know, put a role in perspective and, and, and fight in a way that is more applicable to the self-defense scenario and maybe not go for, you know, that inverted heel hook or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, still make sure you train in that realm. Um, that's one benefit I think comes from teaching law enforcement is that I'm forced to put myself in that spot and train with that mindset. Um, but I've, I encourage anybody that's in jujitsu to, to do the same with their training. You know, it's, just like just like training gi and no gi, like you got to get a blend, you know. No, you you really do, and I mean, like, there's all aspects to it, like you're saying, and um, I think ignoring one and focusing on the other is kind of a, a hindrance. But you know, also there there are people out there who just compete in it. So like, if you want to, something I think about too is like uh, judo, and and something somebody showed me. He's a uh, he's been doing judo for a very long time, so you talk about the like olympic rules and you know he's like man fuck the ijf yeah i'm not gonna tell his name because he pretty much said fuck the ijf but he was like these are uh he's like all these rules it just gets rid of all this shit let me show you something and then he showed uh some judo self-defense and he was like you see when you like take the person down like this you pancake out it's supposed to you know pop their neck or uh and it wasn't like a you know, uh, Steven Seagal, like, out there crazy, like, popping of the neck. Like, if you saw it and you saw him, like, demonstrate how it works, you're like, holy shit. Yeah, that would definitely do that. Like, right. but there's so many throws now that are illegal 
you can't do certain things that like certain people are focused only on um, the sport aspect of it instead of like the whole thing, which is one like one of the main reasons I'm against Brazilian Jiu Jitsu going to the Olympics because then we're going to start seeing that we're going to like at least that's what I feel we're going to start seeing a shift from well what's legal and what's illegal and then go from there. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what happens with any sport. I mean, it's um, sports and martial arts. That, that there's definitely an influence that kind of bleeds over and sometimes bastardizes the style to a certain degree. Um, you know, I think it's competition is great. Um, it's been a long time since I've competed, and you know, there's a lot of guys that uh, that I train with that don't compete that are absolute killers. And so I don't think it's the obligation that some people make it out to be but i think the benefit of it is is that you take somebody maybe a lay citizen that that doesn't work in law enforcement or military or in some type of you know a bouncer or some type of scenario where they actually having to apply this in a realistic setting and sometimes competition will give you that adrenaline dump and an experience that otherwise you wouldn't have and i'd rather see somebody get exposed to that in a tournament than get exposed to that when they're trying to defend themselves or a loved one but i agree with you i think when you get when you start looking at sport um over time it starts to water down when it's a, when it's a combative sport specifically, it starts to water down what that sport, what that art was intended for initially. And Muay Thai is not immune to that either, you know, or kickboxing. I mean, you look at some of the rules and the way they change. I mean, the entire stance of Muay Thai and how it's used sometimes has evolved from the Muay Baran days because of sport, because of the sport, the way that, you know, kicks score higher than punches. And so they developed a more narrow stance to check kicks better, you know, um, still a very brutal and effective martial arts style, obviously. But, you know, you look at that in comparison to, to the Dutch style that you see more frequently in, in, in glory or K one. And, uh, you know, you, you see different stances for different rules and that's just one example. Um, and like you said, yeah, I could see that completely. I personally would love to see jujitsu in the Olympics just to watch the matches, <laughs> but I definitely, you know, I definitely agree with what you're saying. I think it would, it would definitely, uh, affect the the future outcome of jiu-jitsu and you see you see a lot of arguments about that in in the different circles too so yeah i mean like it's it's not so much that i hate sport jiu-jitsu i think it's more or less that i see what could happen and i see the push for it where people are like well it's it'll, it'll be if we put brazilian jiu-jitsu in the olympics there then like more people will sign up for jiu-jitsu then more people can teach and, you know, like it's supposed to be a domino effect, but then at the same time, like, you know, Taekwondo is another good example of, uh, a sport or a martial art that turned into an Olympic sport. And then they're just like, well, shit, like you can't do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, coming from Taekwondo, even before I even did kickboxing and jujitsu, it was still like, yeah, there's some aspects of it. You're like, yeah, it's kind of hokey, but there's still stuff. It's like, well, can you do that in a tournament? And they said, no, because it's illegal and, you know, you don't, you can't just punch somebody right in the face because that's not good in like a tournament aspect. And I'm like, that's kind of, it's kind of shitty, but at the same time, like I understand it as well, because if you go in and compete, you don't want to get destroyed, like physically, physically destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. You only get one fight and your career's over because you got your eyeball poked out. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was Which is pretty good. That kind of brings us to Krav Maga in that sense. That's one thing that yeah, I'm not against Krav Maga, and it's, but I think it's the same thing you're talking about in a different way. So obviously Krav Maga is not a sport. Krav Maga is a system developed for, you know, military in Israel, and is you know there's all kinds of stories passed down, and then it comes over here to the West, and like typical Americans, we water the hell out of it, water it down, and make it even worse, right? Yeah, and so. There's a lot of schools, and I think it depends on which school you go to, who you train with, and their approach to it. But the problem that I've run into with a lot of Krav Maga is no different than what you run into with the traditional martial arts style that you you know you train it in a very static fashion. And there's this expectation of effectiveness that comes with it that doesn't necessarily exist. You know, um, you you parry a haymaker, and then your 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 partner just stands there frozen, like you just did sub zero. Yeah, and you you know, throw this massive combination of attacks at him and then he falls over and crippled. And it's just, it's not an accurate depiction of combat. And so it's kind of the, it's almost the the reverse of what you're talking about. But, you know, I think that's what's advantageous about jujitsu and about wrestling and about, you know, grappling systems that allow for that sparring, even though it's limited in what you can do so you don't mangle your opponent every day. 
you're still going against active resistance, which makes it 10 times more effective than those systems that don't. Um, I mean, I watched a guy get shot four times with a 45 caliber round in my line of work, um, and he kept going. So Shit. you're going to tell me that you can tell me that one A-frame kick is going to end everything every single time? Absolutely not. You know, um, it's going to sometimes it's going to take more than others, and you've got to be willing to transition and, and move on to other things. So, um, and I think very few people know that better than the ones that are applying this stuff in the real world. So, like you said, competitions is great, but sometimes not as great as people think it is. So, yeah, I mean. I think one of the, one of the things I tell my guys is a lot of um, it's good to compete if you can because I feel like it's a really um, like you said it, it induces a lot of stress it induces a lot of you know just unknowns to your jujitsu and how you're going to react to it and what you're going to do against it. But something I also point out to people is that remember that when you do this training, it's not to fight another like blue belt or purple belt or somebody else who's training. It's to make sure you can defend yourself against an untrained attacker. And I don't know, man. I saw something earlier, which was like somebody posted up some street fight. And uh, the dude pulled off this half-assed arm bar, like pinning the guy down. This is after like, um, what was it? His uh, buddy's girlfriend tried to help out and grab the dude by the pants and like pretty much pantsed him on the street, underwear and all while this guy's getting arm barred. So, I mean, like, that's the worst case scenario for me is getting pants while I'm getting arm barred. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, like, the I, I feel like the more exposure, and that goes back with the Olympic thing, like, the more exposure we're going to have in the sport, the more people are going to either emulate it or they're going to, you know, do some sort of training and just, you know, like, keep it in their, back, in their back pocket just in case something happens. Yeah, and I think that that's another thing that could be a mixture of good and bad. Um, more people are training now than ever before. I think that's a pretty accurate statement. I don't have statistics to back it up, but I think with the popularity of you know, mixed martial arts, UFC specifically, and grappling growing in, in popularity, especially in North Carolina, um, more people are training than ever before. And so when we talk about the jiu-jitsu for law enforcement issue, um, something I bring up regularly when I'm teaching is, is – You've got cops that just – some of them, I think it maybe comes from a place of insecurity more than actually believing what they say. But a lot of cops will say, I don't see the value in this training. You know, I don't see why we're doing this. And it's just like you don't understand how many people out there, even with a very elementary level of training, have a huge advantage over you. You know, um, And so it's we, – we've got to be trained in this profession. There's not, it's, not, it's not a matter of – of want to, you have to, you have to, you know, if you're going to go out there and try to affect their rest on somebody, you're going to try to put their hands behind their back and they don't want that to happen. And they're willing to fight you for it. You're in for a bad day, especially if you're not trained, if you're trained, you're still in for a bad day because it's not like grappling on the mats, you know, against your buddies in a controlled environment where we're all in it for each other. No, you're going against somebody who's very selfish. You're going against somebody who is willing to hurt you because they don't want to go to jail or worse. Yeah. You know, um, and you're right. You know, the popularity of jujitsu is you will. You'll have more people that will watch it, emulate it, train. In the, they'll, they'll train in their living room with their socks on with their buddies. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but, dude, I'm telling you, that's still more than what a lot of cops are doing. And that's the sad reality of, of law enforcement defensive tactics and why uh, I bust my ass to, to improve at least my little corner of the world in my department. Um, and it's been, you know, I took over the program, what, two years ago now, I think? And it's been a it's been a work in progress. We're starting to see some results. Um, so yeah, jujitsu training has to be realistic. You know, I mean, yeah, you play in the sports and you learn how to move your body differently on the ground and how to create different leverage. And there's takeaway, but definitely have to apply some realism to your training. Otherwise, you're you're lying to yourself. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that's that's fairly accurate. And that's something I was thinking about too. I wanted to talk to you about. So I know the first time you and I met was um it was like the first time i had been home from germany and it was actually like your test for purple belt and yeah. brian was like oh shit you staying i was like uh, no i got plans i'm so sorry i would have but <laughs> so i mean i remember you becoming a fixture at tftc granted i wasn't there in person but seeing like you know you started to teach classes more posting up about it and now like you're pretty much like one of the main dudes out there so 
when you talk about adding realism to your training, how have you seen your teaching style, I guess, maybe go from when you first started teaching and helping out with jiu-jitsu and kickboxing to where you're at now? And first off, also, I've got to mention, congratulations on getting your brown belt recently, man. Like, that's huge. That's a fucking huge thing, man. No, I appreciate it. I'm still uh, I'm still kind of, you know, when I, when I got it that night, when I got that brown belt, um, I thought I was going to wake up the next morning and it was a dream and I was going to be pissed, you know? <laughs> It still hasn't really fit in. It's, it's, you know, I look back and the, the humble me, you know, still, you never feel like you deserve a belt when you get it and you feel like you got to earn it that much more once you get it. So there's this huge responsibility that comes with tying that thing on. And, uh, you know, it's, it's humbling looking back and seeing the growth because I think that's when you really look back and notice it is when you get promoted to something else. Um, and it's true. I remember the exact wording on it. I'm sure I'm screwing this up royally, but I remember reading a quote a long time ago in jiu-jitsu that kind of resonated with me. And it was, it's not about who's good, it's about who stays. Yeah. And I have gotten smashed thousands of times. And I look back at when I first moved here um, to the Raleigh area from, from Virginia, originally from New York, but when I moved here, I was a blue belt and I was getting smashed over at Gracie Raleigh by some of their white belts. I remember taking my blue belt off and I handed it to uh, Bumpkin over there and I said, look, you, you know, I'll take this back when you feel like I deserve it. And he said, I'm not going to take your belt. He said, just get out here and, and fight and earn it, you know. And I remember the first day I got my, my first stripe of my blue belt over there with Brandon Garner and Bumpkin. I, I felt like I finally – that the, something flicked and I knew that I was going to stay in this forever and I was going to go through whatever it took to get there. You know, and so it's looking back to those days, getting my ass whooped repeatedly. And I think it's life has to be checkered in failure in order to reach success. And you kind of use those as stepping stones. And so to be here at Brown Belt, it's, it's awesome. And it's a huge responsibility, but it's just the beginning, you know. Um, and so on that note, you know, when talking about bringing realism to, to training, I've seen over the last, I mean, I've been doing jiu-jitsu just shy of 10 years now. I've been a cop for 11. So there's a lot of carryover. There's a lot of, you know been running kind of parallel to each other in those two lives. Um, Everything has changed. Everything has changed when I started teaching. I feel like you, there's so much more depth that you learn in jujitsu when you start teaching it to others as opposed to just being a student. Um, You know, you take your game that you think is your A game that you know so well, and that's what you start teaching because you're confident in it. And you find out that there's all these little holes in it that you can close up because you're teaching it to other people to make them better, you know? And uh, as far as applying realism, I think it's it's the approach. You know, I, I try to give, I try to do a little bit of both. I, I teach a little bit of sport, of course, because um, you've got people out there that want to compete and do that. And I also mix in some self defense elements to it. And that could be as simple as defending punches into a clinch position and getting a body lock takedown, establishing a good dominant position, and then working from there. I think that's a big part of self defense. Is you know, in controlling space, distance management is the biggest and most important piece, you know, of any of any combat. Um, putting yourself in the next best position and constantly thinking next best position, next best position. Uh, and that leads all the way up to an eventual submission if that's what you're looking for. But in self-defense, sometimes it stops at control, you know. Um, and so applying that in the, the law enforcement world, a lot of it comes back to control to cuffing and not submission. So it turns into, you know, the old adage, uh, defend position submission, kind of the hierarchy of your approach in jiu-jitsu turns into defend position decision in law enforcement. So I defend what's initially a threat to me. I improve my position, and then I've got a decision to make. Do I disengage? Do I handcuff? Do I escalate my force? Do I go to my tool belt? Um, And so that's how you kind of apply realism to your training is you have to just look at it from a different lens. I see. I see. Okay. So like, um, mainly just options kind of like the big thing for that then. So like, cause I know, um, it's, it's very interesting mainly because like, um, you know, everybody worries about, can I get points from here? Can I get points from here? And something, something I've been trying to explain to my guys too, is like the big thing is getting to a position, breathing for a second, and then you get to make your next move. Like not so much as like scramble, 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 scramble. Hold, wait, decide, go. Hold, wait, decide, go. So that's like 
in essence, you're going to get points there anyways. Like, if you want to look at it from a uh, sport perspective. But even with self-defense or MMA or whatever, it all works together. Absolutely. Well, and then look at why, I maybe mean, if you take it back to why those point, point systems were made. Probably from an elementary understanding of, of that hierarchy, position. You know, wh- why do you have to hold a dominant position for so long to, to get your points? Because we've all done it. I just did it the other night. I just did it yesterday. I was rolling before I went to work, and, um, and I was working on some stuff, you know, bringing some new pieces into my game, and I got a little greedy. And John Burke, one of my, my best training partners, yeah. um, he got his, got his brown belt as well. He called me out on it. He was watching. He said, Randy, you got selfish, man. You got selfish in mount, and you lost your position because of it. And he's right. And we all do it. Nobody's immune to it. Um, but, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's why the point system was made is because of the understanding of that. I mean, control is a huge element. And uh, some guys try to skip steps, and that's what gets them in trouble. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, like, the whole – so the thing is, too, something – I don't know if you see this a lot. And I think it's kind of interesting mainly because, you know, you say you've been doing jujitsu for for about 10 years and stuff, and you kind of see the same thing over and over again with certain people. So, like, one big one for me is I've had to explain to my guys that, hey, if you – are a white belt and you are well first off you don't go to your butt whatsoever no no sitting down like you have to go for Mm -hmm. the dominant position like i feel like no matter what even in those 10 years there's still people making those types of mistakes for whatever reason like is it yeah do do you see like the the mistakes evolving like maybe it's certain like um like they're doing better but it's more of still the same I get like that. I'm sorry. That's a really weird way to explain. Let me try that again. So do you see moves that (laughs) I know, man, I'm all over the place. Do you you see white belts making the same mistakes? Like they've, they've been making 10 years ago, or do you see them evolving, doing better, but still making mistakes? That would be kind of like higher level back in the day. I, I, it's hard to say. I think that because the, the, the art has evolved. You know, I mean, jiu-jitsu has come a long way. And I think people, like you said earlier about exposure, um, even though jiu-jitsu is not in the Olympics, there's still much more exposure and, and visibility now than there was 10 years ago. I mean, not not that many people were training jiu-jitsu back then. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think the mistakes are some, – some of them are the same because people have to learn how to move on the ground, and that's such an awkward and cumbersome thing to learn when you first start out. You're like, I, I don't even know what I'm doing. I feel like a turtle right now. You know, right. Um, and, and so some of those things are still very common, but you do see, I think, some people coming in that have like this super basic understanding in their head of the fact that at least they understand top position is better. I want to get top position. You know, um, they understand to cross their leg. I mean, think about things that we take for granted. They understand to cross the legs behind your back or on your hips if you're on top. They can get guard. They understand that that's better than being mounted back in the day people didn't even know that you know yeah um and so it's i remember watching an old it was an old hoist crazy uh, about the ufc and the, the commentators were they had zero understanding of jiu-jitsu and uh he had uh he had the guy in guard he was working He was working for a diamond position he's working for triangles working for arm bar and he's attacking and to know jiu-jitsu and watch you're like oh he's doing really good everybody all the commentators were saying how much trouble hoist crazy was in oh he's in a bad spot he's on the bottom and you know, so you think about that. That's all. That's all different now. Most people out there, if you go up to somebody in the street, um, they kind of have an idea that guard is better than than nothing. And guard is certainly a great position, but in self defense world, it's not really where you want to stay because you can still get punched in the face unless you're controlling their upper body, their posture, their arms. You know. Yeah. Um, and so, I think that to answer your question, I think that you see a lot of the same things that are just kind of common among people that have never been on the ground before wrestlers obviously are the exe- are the exception if they were high school wrestlers then they come in with a little bit of an advantage um but at the same time it is a little bit different they ha- at least have some understanding of the direction they want to go in even if they don't know how to apply it yet so well yeah i think it's mainly just like um just being used to it i guess but uh but i mean like so now we have all these people jumping into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's a good thing. This is another thing I wanted to talk to you about because being an instructor, being around like 
I guess, kind of the hard times you want to talk about. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> whereas either you showed up and you survived or you don't like you don't show up again. It's like you get right. beat up, you get beat up or you leave. Like that's that's really about it. Do you see a shift in focus on instruction for that? Maybe keeping more people around or there's still some elements out there kind of uh, like, well, if they show up and they get beat up and they quit, no big deal. I think, well, I think TFTC specifically, uh, and I've seen it in other places too, but I think specifically TFTC has a, an environment and it started way back. Uh, you know, I say way back, wasn't really that long ago, but when they first opened the carry location and I moved over here, uh, when Brian Mingy and Neil Weaver and, and Brad were running the program, it started back then the, the TFTC environment is just kind of, it's just really conducive to learning. Um, it's not, it's not as intense of an atmosphere. Don't, don't get me wrong. There are killers on the mat. Oh, you yeah. know, and, and it is still jujitsu and it is still hard and it is still miserable sometimes. Um, but I think that the approach that TFTC takes and that I've seen in a lot of other jujitsu schools, especially over the past few years, um, open guard is kind of the same way. Um, you know, you start to see, no, you don't want to just smash the brand new white belt, scare him away. And he never comes back for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it's terrible for business, right? I'm not <laughs> yeah. even on the business side. I don't make any money on this. But obviously, common sense would tell you if I scare away all my clientele, there's no money being brought in the gym. The gym can't stay above water, and it's gone, right? Yeah. But but more important than that, and that's that's the last. That's like bottom of the barrel as far as importance. The the most important reasons is you want these people in there to learn because jiu-jitsu improves people, you know? Um, Eddie Bravo, ironically, um, made the comment that, that jiu-jitsu is a douchebag filter. And, and I think I said, I think that, I said that in the last time we did the podcast too, but it still applies, you know, it's, yeah. and it's funny because it's true though. You, you get humbled in jiu-jitsu. It improves your life because you're, you're in there, you're learning how to be resilient. You're learning how to improve position. You're learning how to defend yourself and protect your family. There are so many intangibles, things that you can't put a price tag on. And, and I wouldn't want to scare somebody away from jiu-jitsu. You know, I, you have so many different walks of life. I mean, I'm a cop. There's people in the gym that hate cops, but they love me. And so what does that do? It softens their opinion of police officers a little bit, maybe opens that window of opportunity to talk about it, you know? Um, so I would never, I would never uh, want to scare somebody out of jiu-jitsu. And the way you do that is you bring them in and, and it's the contrary to popular belief. You actually, you, you don't, first of all, you don't let them spar the first maybe the first week there, get them, get them acclimated, teach them some basic positions and survival skills, because that's what white belt's going to be about is surviving. Right. Yeah. And then, and then what you do is you put them with your higher guys, your higher belts, because the higher belts aren't going to, their, their ego is gone. They're, they're not going to, they're not in there to win. They're not in there to smash this guy. They, they understand the positions. They can control themselves very, very well. And they'll show this guy the ropes or girl, the ropes. And, I think that uh, that's really, really important because we want – I want everybody to jiu-jitsu. Just like I want, you know, most people – I shouldn't say everybody. I can't say everybody on this one. But most people should carry a gun. Most people should get trained on how to shoot one. Most people should carry concealed, you know. Um, jiu-jitsu should be everywhere because I think it would improve society hand over fist. Um, just seeing just seeing the little community that we have here in, in, in carry and then also – statewide north carolina is pretty unique in that everybody pretty much gets along as tight knit i can go anywhere i want and train they can come to tftc and train that was so, some i was gonna say that is something that is fairly unique about north carolina jiu-jitsu is that everybody kind of knows everybody and that there was no i guess maybe animosity towards other gyms just because like nobody's ever had an issue I mean, granted, you know, like there, I've been to gyms where other places have had issues with them, but that's mainly because of like, uh, yeah, that guy kind of ran off and, you know, took everybody's tuition or like, yeah, that guy was, uh, you know, sleeping around with all of his students and like, you know, sleeping with married dudes, wives that came in for jujitsu. Like, you know, that's kind of, I think that's kind of a good reason not to go train at that academy, (laughs) not to go train at an academy like that. But like. For the douchebag filter, that's always been like, for me, that's always been kind of a point of contention, honestly, because even though Eddie Bravo said uh, it's a douchebag filter, it's supposed to help, 
you know, get rid of the ego. It's supposed to, like, you know, the majority of people I've met in jujitsu have been just solid people who just want to train and have a good time. However, got to add on to that. I've run into <laughs> a few black belts where I'm like, how the fuck did you get this far? Like, you are a dick, man. Like, w- like why? Why act this way? Like, I always found that weird. Is it maybe like a douchebag filter up until you get a little more ego? Or maybe it's just they kind of slip through the cracks? I think a lot of it is, I, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a black belt, so I don't know. And, and thankfully, I haven't really been exposed to uh, too many of those. You know, the black belts I've trained with have all been pretty outstanding people. Yeah. Um, but I know what you're talking about. And I, th- and I think I think a lot of it is maybe untapped ego. There's nothing limiting it. There's no governor on it because they're a black belt. You know, maybe they're, maybe that's part of it. Um, I'm not sure. Or maybe it's like, you know, I mean, look at law enforcement. Law enforcement is no different. Law enforcement is comprised mostly of phenomenal people that they have the best of intentions, but you have bad apples in there. And those are the ones that get all the media attention. Those are the ones you see posted all over YouTube. And us good cops are sitting back like, man, what a douchebag, you know? And, and, and we don't like that guy any more than anyone else doesn't like him. Um, if anything is worse, it makes our job more dangerous. But I think it's kind of the same concept. You know, you, somebody has to check them. Somebody has to bring them back to reality. And if, and if, if ego is left unchecked, then it turns into bad things. And uh, that's, I, so I don't know. That's the only thing I can assume is, you know, as a brown belt, I'm still getting smashed. I'm still getting beat up on the mat. I'm still very well aware that I am nowhere near the baddest dude around. I'm not even the baddest dude on the mat in, in TFTC, you know? And if you take a black belt that, you know, you got there, obviously, hey, you got your black belt, man. You know, if it's a legit black belt, you earned that over years and years and years and years and years of hard training. And you're probably a bad dude. But if you lose perspective, then the mentality goes right back to white belt, you know? Yeah. Um, and, I mean, every every black belt that I've trained with and been on the mats with, I mean, I went over to, to Spangler Jiu-Jitsu and rolled over there. Obviously, I used to train at Gracie Raleigh, TFTC Carey, TFTC Clayton. Um, you know, way back when I was 16, I went to New York City and trained a little bit with Matt Sarah for a weekend, you know, um, I've trained with Carlson Gracie Jr. Um, I've been around for a little bit and, and had the honor and privilege of training with a lot of really, really, really high level and great people. And every one of them were awesome. Um, humble, you know, the, the epitome of what you think is a black belt. Um, and so, I, you know, I would hope that, the, that that's a rare thing. But my assumption would be that it's just untapped egos. Fair enough. Or unchecked egos. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, that's, I mean, that is a really interesting perspective upon it. And I'm, I don't know. Maybe it's more of a, I just got to run a bad block because I've only run in, I've only, honestly, like the same thing. I've only run, in, run into a couple of really bad ones where I'm like, uh, you're what? You're a black belt? Really? All right, man. You're a black belt. Cool. The other black belts I've trained with have never acted, would never act like this. But I think it's just, just luck of the draw, I guess. So, so Randy, before we uh, finish up this uh, episode of the podcast, is there anybody you'd want to give a shout out to? Anything you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, always. I mean, I'm always real appreciative of everybody I train with. Um, obviously, yourself included, buddy. It's always good when you come back here to visit. Um, you know, I, I think I uh, obviously I got to thank Jeff Baum. He's the one that promoted me to Brown Belt. Um, he's taught a lot of the instructors that I've had the privilege of, of training with. My family, my dad, my stepmom. Stepmom actually paid for my first martial arts class, so I wouldn't be here, obviously, if it weren't for that. And now it's turned into a, a line of work and a passion on top of that. My mom, my whole family, uh, John Maya, Wyatt Crabtree over at the department I work for for being the training coordinator. My boss there support me all the time. Brad, Jeremy, John over at TFTC, you know, Rodney and Jordan and Adam. I could go on for days on names. I'm, I can't go through them all right now, but everyone at TFTC – you know, I'm, I'm just appreciative of everybody that has sweated and bled on the mat with me to help me get better so I could help them get better. You know, it just goes around and around. So, um, and I, I look forward to doing more of these too. There's definitely a lot to talk about. So, well, there are definitely going to be more op- or not options, opportunities for this to go down. So, Rini, I'm really glad you're able to come on. I'm glad we got to talk a little bit more about uh, jujitsu and especially got to talk about that really cool video, Matt, <laughs> of Matt taking care of business out there. 
Yeah, I encourage everybody to watch that. That's a good video. It's pretty cool. <laughs> well, thanks again, man. And uh, we can't wait to have you back on the show soon. All right, buddy. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of the Big Jiu-Jitsu Show, a member of the Pod Bros Podcast Network. Go to podbros.com and find yourself another podcast you want to listen to. And don't forget to check out our sponsors, Trap and Roll Soap Company, Rolls Gear, and Tape Armor. You can find all of our old episodes at bjjshow.com, our YouTube page, and on iTunes. Don't forget to write, rate and subscribe to us on there. I'm Rob. We'll see you guys next time.